Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a very interesting series entitled Three Cosmic Messages. This is lesson number 10 in that series for June 3 of 2023 entitled Satan's Final Deceptions. That should be serious, shouldn't it? Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you so much for your giving us warnings far in advance of what's coming. Satan, we know, is, is angry. He's desperate. He's, you know, in a life and death struggle to preserve his life. And now as we face that, those final days of trouble with him, Help us to know how to stand faithful for the truth is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Revelation 13, verses 3 and 4, and 7 and 8, tell us that virtually the whole world is going to be confused and poisoned by Satan's misrepresentations and lies about God. Satan's deadly potion is called the wine of Babylon. This consists of false doctrines and teachings that will eventually lead to death because they turn people away from the truth about God. So if you drink something and you find out that you've just drunk something that's going to kill you, what do we call that? It's a deadly potion, isn't it? So let's look at those verses. Jim? Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 and 4 and 7 and 8. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast also, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? Okay, let me interrupt for just a second. How many are worshipping the dragon? Everyone. Everyone. And who is the dragon? The devil. Okay, go ahead. It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them. It was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. All people living on the earth belong to the Lamb that was killed, American Bible Society. No, yeah, we'll worship it. Those did whose I, name... I, skipped, I think I skipped a yeah. sentence here. All yeah, people. We'll worship it, except those whose names are written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which it belongs to the Lamb that was killed from the American Okay, Bible. very Sorry, good. Excuse me. However, God has an answer. We know that God's side will win in the end. In fact, technically, God's side has already won, hasn't it? Yes. We know that Satan's side will be defined by the sins they practice. So what is sin, and how does the Bible define sin? Charles? First John 3, 4. Whoever sins is guilty of breaking God's law because sin is a breaking of the law. Romans chapter 14, verse 23. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith. And anything that is not based on faith is sin. So faith is that knowledge about God, the study of the Bible, prayer, you know, witnessing the things that lead us closer to God. Those things are called faith. Things that lead us away from God are called sin. Sin and, and, and faith are opposites. Why is Satan so successful? Who are the elect who will not be deceived by him? Let us not be confused or deceived, although the deceptions will be powerful. Gordon. Mark 13, 22, Jesus said, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. And Matthew 24, 31, Jesus again said, The great trumpet will sound, and he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the earth to the one end of the world to the other. Good News Bible. So Revelation 13, which is, what is Revelation 13? That's a presentation of Satan's side in the great controversy. And Revelation 12, 9, talk about people joining Babylon, Satan's side. Revelation 12, 9. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent, serpent 
called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He is thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Good News Bible. Isaiah, who lived in the late 8th century BC, that would be 700 and probably he was born about 725 or 30 BC, down to, and he lived until 600 and some BC, foretold Babylon's fate. From our Bible study guide, quote, it will never be inhabited, nor will be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch their tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheep folds there, Isaiah 13, 20. Throughout the centuries, this prophecy has been proven true. Alexander the Great of Greece, after conquering that whole area, brought 10,000 men to Babylon to clear the ruins and rebuild the city. He died in Babylon before the project could be accomplished. Subsequent to his death, the mission was abandoned. The city has lain in ruins for more than 2,500 years from our Adult Teachers Bible Study Guide. So now we're not talking about the physical Babylon, then are we? We're talking about the spiritual Babylon. What do we know about spiritual Babylon? From our Bible study, I mean, from the Bible commentary, Babylon, both literal and mystical, has thus long been recognized as a traditional enemy of God's truth and people. As used in the Revelation, the name is symbolic of all apostate religious organizations and their leadership from antiquity down to the close of time. Okay, this prophecy of the fall of Babylon finds its fulfillment in the departure of Protestantism at large from the purity and simplicity of the gospel from volume 7, page 830. Throughout the book of Revelation, spiritualism is one of Satan's final deceptions to unite the world and lead it to Earth's final conflict between the people of God and the forces of evil. Revelation 16, 14 states, quote, for they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle, that great day of God Almighty, from our New King James Version. Revelation 19, 20 adds that those who received the mark of the beast were deceived by these false spectacular wonders or signs and Revelation 13 confirms that the devil deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. So what does it mean he was granted to do? Permitted, allowed. That means he was allowed by God to do these things. According to Revelation 18:2, Babylon has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit. Under the guise of spiritualism, Satan will work with lying wonders and all deceivableness. One of his final deceptions will be the impersonation of the dead by his evil angels and a distortion of Bible truth, including the Sabbath. So two things we're looking for. What are they? The Various manifestations of spiritualism and a false Sabbath, right? Unfortunately, we are all born selfish. Our natural tendencies are toward evil. It is, that what, is that why Satan is so successful in deceiving us? Hmm, what do you think? I think that's true. If we have that tendency already, he's just feeding into what we want to do. Yeah. Okay, Jim, Proverbs 14 there. Okay, Proverbs 14, 12. What you think is the right road may lead to death. So trusting our own inclinations is not safe. And you want to go ahead and read those next two? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Who can understand the human heart? There is nothing else so deceitful. It is too sick to be healed. Romans 3, 9 to 18. Well then, we are... Are oh. we Jews in the any better condition than the Gentiles? Not at all. I have already shown that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the same, under the power of sin. As let, me, let me interrupt for just a moment there. Romans 3, well, Romans 1 is, is Paul's introduction to the book of Romans. He says God wants to save everybody. And then he talks about how wicked, how sinful, the Gentiles have been. 
and he turns to Romans 2 and he spells out how bad the Jews have been, the people who supposedly were supposed to be carrying God's message to the world. Then he goes to Romans 3, and how does he start out in Romans 3? All of us are in this boat together, right? And so, go ahead, Jimmy. He's going to talk about all of us now. Well then, are we Jews any better conditioned than the Gentiles? Not at all. I have already shown that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the same power of sin. As the scripture says, there is no one who is righteous, no one who is wise, or the, who worships God. All have turned away from God. They have all gone wrong. No one knows, excuse me, no one does what is right, and not even one. Their words are full of deadly deceit. Wicked lies roll off the, their tongues, and dangerous threats like sna snakes poison from their lips. Their speech is filled with bitter curses. They are quick to hurt and kill. They leave ruin and destruction wherever they go. They have not known the path of peace, nor have they learnt reverence from God. That's wow. pretty a big indictment, isn't it? Yeah. And what do we know from the book of Judges about everybody's ability to do right? Judges 21, 25. There was no king in Israel at that time. Well, there was not supposed to be a king. God yeah. was. No. You see? All the people did just as they pleased. And we know how bad that got, don't we? We can read how bad things were in the book of Judges. Read Judges 19 and 20. It is clear that, le that left to ourselves, we are all headed for destruction. Our only solution is to focus on Jesus as represented in Bible study, prayer, and witnessing the things that are promoted by the Bible. Many examples could be given throughout history of times when people thought they were doing right when they were actually doing things very wrong. The prime example is the behavior of the Pharisees and Sadducees who murdered Jesus. They thought they were doing what was right. Well, right for them anyway. So what are the two major lies that Satan is promoting in our day? One is the lie of natural the lie of natural immortality, the other is Sunday sacredness. So, what do we read about those situations? Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle on the great day of Almighty God. Good News Bible. Okay, now let's think about this for a moment. These creatures, the beast, I'm sorry, the dragon, the first beast, the mouth of the false prophet, are those uh, good, good individuals? Not at all. So the spirits that come out of them are demons that perform miracles? What kind of miracles are we expecting? Oh, I'm just I'm wondering about the frogs. Yeah. Uh, was uh, the frog a uh, god? Uh, I know it was in Pharaoh's yes. time. Is that what it's giving the example of? Or Yeah. Um, probably. I, I, I just am trying to imagine the picture that mm -hmm. John is trying to describe here. Yeah. Okay, Revelation 18, 2 and 23. He cried out in a loud voice, She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. Never again will the light of the lamp be seen in you. No more will the voices of brides and grooms be heard in you. Your merchants were the most powerful in all the world, and with your false magic, you deceived all the peoples of the world. Good News Bible. Okay. The idea of the immortality of the soul was prevalent in ancient Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. 
when cause yes. since it was present so long ago, doesn't that make it right? <laughs> that concept so wow. long ago. In fact, we some know have, some have argued who, that. Who was the first one that we know of that promoted the idea of a natural immortality? The snake slash the devil snake. in the tree. Right yes. there in the Garden of Eden. Right there in the Garden of Eden. And so, in the eyes of most of the Protestants today, God was lying. Yeah. When Constantine declared the Christian Church to be the predominant church in the Roman Empire, pagan ideas gradually crept into the Christian Church as pagans joined the Church. Myra, I think that's yours. Oh. In the Old Testament, the spirits of the dead played a major part in the Babylonian religion. The Babylonians had a strong belief in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. They believed at death that the soul entered the spirit world. The concept of the immortal soul is foreign to the teachings of Scripture. The Jewish encyclopedia clearly identifies the origin of the false idea of the immortality of the soul. The belief that the soul continues its existence after the dis, 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 dissolution yeah, of the body is nowhere expressly taught in the Holy Spirit it's or not, Holy not just, Scripture. Not just expressly, but at all, is yeah. it? Yeah. The belief of the immortality of the soul came to the Jews from contact with Greek thought and chiefly through the philosophy of Plato. Its principal com exponent, who has, who was led to it through the Orphic and Hallucinian, okay, uh, mysteries in which Babylon and the Egyptian views were strangely blended. This is from the Immortality of the Soul by Kaufman. Okay. Cooler. So what are we saying? We're saying that these ideas are ancient. They were, yeah. they were strongly promoted by, I mean, if you've ever looked at any of the Egyptian history, think about the boats that were made. If you go to some of the major museums of, of antiquity, huge boats were made to carry the soul across the river of, you know, the, the, of death and off in it, and all these other characters were put on there to serve you and so forth. Why is it the most Christian so, yeah. question? So this, this says from the Bible study guide, quoting from this book, that the belief of the so uh, the mm -hmm. immortality comes for, came from the Greeks, but as as we said earlier, it came from Satan in the garden. Yes. Well, and Satan had never uh, never seen death. Yeah. At least we have no record. Uh, if we use the Bible, we have no biblical record that there had been any death prior to. Yeah. Uh, well, you you just Abel. wiped out the whole theory of evolution. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff we're going to have to <laughs> deal with. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the point. See, but what this thing is saying that it was the teachings, the Greek teachings coming from Plato. He had brought up all these other ideas and sort of brought them into his teachings. And it was that root that, that carried it into the Christian church. And what does it say in Revelation 12, 9? It talks about the deceiver. Mm -hmm. And how do you deceive? You take the good chunk of hamburger and you hide the cyanide capsule inside. You don't make, oh, here's a cyanide capsule. Take your pick. Mm -hmm. Why is it then that most Christian churches today still teach the natural immortality of the soul? And what does the Bible say about that? Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6 says, Yes, the living know they're going to die, but the dead know how much? Nothing. Nothing. They have no further reward. They are completely forgotten. Their loves, their hates, their passions all died with them. They will never again take part in anything that happens in this world. Now, of course, we would say eventually the world would be, there will be a new world. They would have a part of that if, they, if they're faithful. What did Job say about that? Job 19, 25 to 27 from Job's speech. But I know there is someone in heaven who will come at last to my defense. Even after my skin is eaten by disease while still in this body, I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes and he will not be a stranger. 
and then back all the way over in the New Testament from Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, there will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice. And who's the archangel? Jesus. Michael. Jesus. Michael, another code name for Jesus. The sound of God's trumpet and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will, be, will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So what's going to happen? All of us, the formerly dead and the currently living, will be gathered up together to meet the Lord in the air. Well, help me understand a little bit the Protestant theology and then Catholic so when they die, they go straight to heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. yes. So when Jesus comes the second time, they'll come separately from Jesus. They're going to come down here and he's going to take everyone them, back to heaven. Is that what the deal is? We'll put them back in the grave and then <laughs> yeah, take them out of here. Right, right. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Revelation 14, 13 says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Happy are those from now on, who from now on die in the surface of the Lord. Yes, indeed, answers the Spirit. They will enjoy rest from their hard work because the results of their service go with them. Okay, Jim, I'm going to ask you to read the Bible study guide there. One of the pillars of the Babylonian deception is a false understanding of death, which centers in the idea of the immortality of the soul, prepares the way for the deceptive influence of spiritualism. If you believe that the dead, in some form, live on and might even be able to communicate with us, then what protection do you have from any of the myriad deceptions that Satan has? If someone who you thought was de your dead mother or child or someone else beloved was suddenly to appear be and talk to you, how easy would it be to be fooled by your senses? This has happened in the past, however, how, to me, this has, has happened, happened in the past, happens now, and certainly as we near the very final days will happen again. Okay, I'm going to have a little trivia question for you. Where, when does this, two places this happened in the Bible? I'm thinking one particularly. Can you think of a time when, when a somewhere. spirit appeared to somebody in the night when they were sleeping? In Job. Job chapter 4, right there. Go ahead. And Saul. And the, yeah. Uh, King well, Saul, yeah. The Witch of Endor. Yeah, exactly. That's the second one. This is what happened in the past now, and certainly as we near the very final days will happen again. Our only protection is to stand firmly rooted in what the Bible teaches and to cling to the biblical teaching about death as a sleep until the second coming of Jesus from the Bible Study Guide for Monday, May 29. Okay, can you think of any examples of Satan's lies that are commonly promoted in our day? His very first lie, right? The first one we know about. Think of all the movies. The first one on this earth, to humans yeah. anyway, that yeah. are, that's recorded. Think of all the movies, and I'm not a movie fan, so I don't really look at very many of them, but it, you, you hear people talk about them all the time. Think of all the movies that play on the idea that someone is still alive and can influence events on this planet. What did Ellen White say about that? The doctrine of human consciousness and in death, especially the belief that spirits of the dead return to, the, to minister to the living has prepared the way for modern spiritualism. If the dead are admitted to the presence of God and holy angels, and privileged with knowledge far exceeding that they before possessed, they should then they not why? return. Why should they? Yeah. Why should they not return to the earth to enlighten and instruct the living? He, yeah. Satan, has power to bring before men the appearance of their uh, departed friends. He has the power to do that. Okay, yes. the counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous disti distinctness. Many are confronted, comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven and without suspicion or danger, they give ear 
to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. Wow. I think it's so easy though for us humans to find comfort, you know, when you lose someone yep. Yep. and the devil knows it. And Yep, exactly. Well, we belong to a church which has prided itself on following the Bible and the Bible only. We need to recognize that statement. That statement from Ellen Wright was originally the claim of all, Protest all Protestantism. They believed they followed the Bible and the Bible only. That was the rallying call of the Protestant Reformation. Yes. What, 500 years ago? In the Teacher's Bible Study Guide, it says, lest we, lest we pride ourselves on our knowledge of Bible truth and believe we are in no immediate danger from such blatant deceptions, think again. Modern spiritualism extends far beyond the impersonation of our loved ones by evil angels. Bible-believing Adventists are, for the most part, not going to be tricked by Beelzebub appearing at the foot of their bed at night as dear old Uncle Barney back from the grave with, quote, new light, end quote, on the Sabbath. Spiritualism in its modern incarnation finds its expression in a more subtle, though devastating, attack on Bible truth. From the Bible, Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Boy. What it, way is that going to be? Well. What way is it now? Yeah, think about what's going on in our world. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about what's going on now with this, these 3D presentation, the glasses you put on and you can, they, you can be anywhere. You know, you're there like this and, you know, the kids are playing, they're playing games and so forth like this and uh, there's an advertising. Yeah. What? Yeah. Virtual, Virtual reality. reality, yeah. They, they, you know, an advertisement on television right now promoting that stuff is the woolly mammoths may be gone, but your kids can go and see them. Well, how far is that from seeing whatever the devil wants you to see? What about this chat GPT stuff oh, that's yeah. coming? It's great. It, isn't that a, a parallel to uh, Ouija boards? Well, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it would sure be easy to manipulate, it seems to me. Yeah. The chat GPT, supposedly, well, in fact, I know it's true so far. What happens in the future, I never can say, but uh, it as all it does is it's based, what it says is based on stuff it has collected from the internet already. And may not and be there's true. No it's falsehood pure. on the internet, is <laughs> No, there's certainly, uh, but I'm saying, it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not only through the ideas and the various implications of spiritualism that Satan has attacked, but also he will very openly attack on the issues of the Sabbath truth. From the Bible study guide for, well, adult teachers Bible study guide. The chief god of the Babylonians is El Marduk. He was depicted as sitting on the golden throne in a golden temple before a golden table. He was the sun god of justice, light, truth, and kingly authority. Wow. Where did the idea of sun, sun worship come from to begin with? Sun worship was, and from our Bible study guide, sun worship was prominent in Egypt, Assyria, Persia, and certainly Babylon. In his book, The Worship of Nature, James G. Fraser makes this observation, quote, in ancient Babylonia, the sun was worshiped from immemorial antiquity. We, in other words, farther back than we can trace it. It may seem surprising, but at times Babylonian sun worship influenced the worship of God's people in the Old Testament. Oh dear. That's from our Bible study guide for Tuesday, May 30. Encyclopedia Britannica has an, in, I remember the days when we thought that was the ultimate source of truth. Has and an now it's Wikipedia. Huh? Now it's Wikipedia. <laughs> well, no, we're brighter than that has an insightful article describing the influence of the sun god on past civilizations. According to the editors of Britannica, the ancients believed the sun is the bestower of light and life to the totality of the cosmos. 
With his unblinking, all-seeing eye, he is, the, he is the stern guarantor of justice. With the almost universal connection of light with enlightenment or illumination, the sun is a source of wisdom. These qualities, sovereignty, power of beneficence, justice, and wisdom are central to any elite religious group, and it is within these contexts that a highly developed solar ideology is found. Kings ruled by the power of the sun and claimed descent from the sun. Solar deities, gods personifying the sun, are sovereign and all-seeing. The sun is often a prime attribute of or is identified with the supreme deity. And there's the article which is quoted in our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 135. So, you, I'm sorry, we're doing a lot of quotations in this lesson, but I mean, I, I, just, I think that these are important sources of information. So, the Babylonians, along with their pagan counterparts, gave great reverence to the sun god Bel Marduk. The false religious system of end-time Babylon, Babylon disregards the law of God as did its ancient counterpart. In the early centuries, a compromise occurred in the Roman Church to accommodate the surrounding pagan culture. So what happened? Constantine adopted, adopted Christianity, and so pretty soon everybody else, will you follow the emperor, join the church? Well, we don't have to give up all those pagan ideas. We can just come with our pagan ideas. Well, the heathen Roman Empire adopted the Persian god Mitra uh, sun worship. So that's when it came and uh, the pa pa papal Rome says, that's fine, you know, yeah. we're going to continue with that. We are at peace. Yeah. So disassociate from the Jews and to evangelize the heathen, church and state leaders united to honor Sunday. So we don't want to be mixed up with those Jews who worship on Saturday. First as a civil rest day and then as the official day of worship. Through the centuries of the Middle Ages under the auspices of Babylon, this church-state religio-political alliance substituted the human traditions for the Word of God. The worship of idols replaced worshiping Jesus directly. The Bible truth about the state of the dead was su supplanted by the air of the immortality of the soul. The Sabbath was changed from the seventh day Saturday to the first day Sunday. It appeared that error and falsehood were triumphant. But the Bible's last book, Revelation, prophesied that God would raise up a last day remnant who, saved by grace and through the power of the living Christ, would live in godly obedience and proclaim his last day message to the world. Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 135 again. Were God's faithful people in Judah re really influenced by ideas of sun worship? Jim? Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 16. 8, verse 16. Chapter 8, verse 16. So he took me to the inner courtyard of the temple. There, near the entrance of the sanctuary, between the altar and the passage, were about 25 men. They had turned their backs to the sanctuary <coughs> and were bowing low toward the east, worshiping the rising sun. Now, we don't have to take time to do this whole thing, but God took Ezekiel, who was a prisoner over in Babylon, in vision, back to Jerusalem, and this is what he saw. This is, so this is before the, the destruction of Jerusalem? No, this was after the destruction of Jerusalem, but before the destruction of Babylon. This is during the Babylonian Empire. Yes, during the Babylonian Empire. Something that was already time. happening. Yep. Hmm. So, 2 Kings 23, 5 and 11. He, Josiah, removed from the office the priests that the kings of Judah had ordained to offer sacrifice on the pagan altars in the cities of Judah and in places near Jerusalem. All the priests who offered sacrifices to Baal, to the sun, the moon, and the planets, and the stars. Um, so let's, let's look at this context now. The last good uh, um, king of, of, the, of the southern kingdom, 
the last good king of the southern kingdom of Judah, he's trying to do a purge here and getting rid of all the priests who are promoting, uh, you know, sun worship, all these things, worship of Baal, the sun, the moon, planets, and the stars. He also removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the worship of the sun, and he burned the chariots used in this worship. These were kept in the temple courtyard. Wow. In the mm -hmm. temple courtyard. Yes. <laughs> near the gate and not far from the living quarters of Nathan Melech, the high official. Okay. So are these horses, the, we know that the horses were offensive weapons, the chariots were offensive weapons. Was war their weapon? Was war their god? Sounds like it. I mean, it, the idea, remember that when they, there was two nations going against each other in ancient times, if you won, they, if you conquered the other nation, it was believed that was because your god was more powerful than their god. Regional gods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, just to look one more time, the northern kingdom, none of the kings ever followed Christ. And God. None, none. None. In the southern kingdom, four of them A were few. really, truly faithful. The other four kind of washy-washy. And Josiah was one of them. He was only eight years old. When he became king. The king, yeah. But what a reform he made throughout yeah. the country. Yeah. Well, Romans 1, 25, way over in the New Testament, tells us, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. Okay, so they so, worship what God created rather than God. And this is a description of, in Romans 1, so in Romans 1, he's talking about the pagan religions. Pagans. How could Paul stand in the courtyard of the famous Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem? Did I say Paul? Did I say people? people. Yeah. Okay. People? Turn their backs on the temple and worship the sun. Hmm. Historically, we know what happened. Constantine saw what he thought was a miraculous sign in the heavens that he would be victorious in his battle against two other Roman generals. He was successful. As a result, following his mother's example, he chose to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. From the uh, Bible study guide, it's quoted, the sun was universally celebrated as an invincible guide and protector of Constantine. That's from the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Constantine, Constant, uh, in AD 321, Constantine also passed the first Sunday law. This edict stated, on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed. Edict of Constantine, A.D. 321. That's in we, the Bible study guide for Tuesday, May 30. Yeah. We should note that this was not a law requiring people to observe Sunday. It was just a suggestion and encouragement. So how long do you think it took for that to their practice to be adopted, not very long. It uh, very slowly but very craftfully they they got this into. Uh, yeah. So how prevalent is Sunday worship in our day? Nobody on our day would be deceived, right? <laughs> Most important of all, how can we protect ourselves against these deceptions? Ellen White comments, in order to endure the trial before them, they must, un talking about the people at the end of time, they must understand the will of God is revealed in his word. They can honor him only as they have a right conception of his character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. Wow. In order to be successful, we have to have a right understanding of God's character, government, and purposes. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hours even now at hand are, are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word. Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Famous words in Great Controversy, 593, 594. 
Staying true to God's word is our only safety. Now look at some examples of statements that have been made by people from other religions. Jim? Here is a remarkable statement by Dr. Edward T. Hiscox, the author of the Standard Manual for, for Baptist Churches. In 1893, he addressed a group of hundreds of Baptist ministers and shocked them as he explained how Sunday became, in, it's going to became into the Christian church. What a pity that is, Sunday comes branded with the mark of paganism and the Christian, excuse me, and christened with the name of the sun god, then adopted and sanctioned by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to the Protestant, to Protestantism. Wow. Bef that is before a New York minister's conference. Well, the, the, there's a document that we is available. The Catholics make fun of the uh, Protestants. Protestants because they says you're yeah, not Protestant. What are you protesting? You, you, yeah. you bought this line, and and the, the Catholic Catechism says Sunday is a day that follows the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Well, got to The point. keeping of the Sabbath will be an indication that those who are faithful to God set themselves apart as separate from Satan's forces in the world. At the end of this world's history, the faithful people of God will be standing up for the truth even in the face of threats of death. But we also need to remember that everything that we say, even think or do, are a representation of God to those who we know, those who know that we are Christians. And I'll take that a step further. When our children are small, we are God to them. We may not think that, we may not act like that, but as far as they're concerned, we are the authority. Are they attracted by what they see, or are they repulsed? First Corinthians 10, 11, all these things happened to them as examples for others. And they were written down as warning for us for we live at a time when the end is about to come. Yeah. We are told that the woman in scarlet and purple in Revelation 17 is going to deceive the world by making them drunk with her wine. What is that wine? Ellen White said, What is that wine? Her, that is Babylon's false doctrines. She has given to the world a false Sabbath instead of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and has repeated the falsehood that Satan first told to Eve in Eden, the natural immortality of the soul. That's in Review and Herald, 1892. And let's, let's take just a moment, think about other things that have come up as a result of those teachings. If you don't believe in, if you believe in the natural immortality of the soul, and you believe in Sunday sacredness, you've given up the Sabbath, which is a memorial of creation, so now in comes evolution. I mean, it's a whole package. If you, if, you know, you buy that whole collection of things. God has always been trying to encourage his chosen people to live faithful, observant lives so that those around them can see the advantages of doing that. In Romans 1, 5, through him, God gave me the privilege of being an apostle, an apostle for the sake of Christ in order to lead people of all nations to believe and obey the Good News Bible. Okay. And in Deuteronomy 4, 6, obey them faithfully, and this will show the people of other nations how wise you are. When they hear of all these laws, they will say, what wisdom and understanding that great nation has. Wow. Is that what they said? Hmm. Is that what people say about the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, maybe not because maybe we aren't following the, the laws. And, so, maybe, and maybe they didn't say that of Israel because yeah. Israel didn't either. Yeah. Let us clarify as best we can what the final issues will be. From our, from our SDA Bible commentary, Babylon the Great, quote unquote, in the book of Revelation designates in a special sense the united apostate religions at the close of time. Babylon the Great again, in the 
apost in, in quotes, is a name by which inspiration refers to the great threefold religious union, the papacy, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism. The term Babylon refers to the organizations themselves and to their leaders, not so much to the members as such. The latter are referred to as many waters. In the Bible study guy, I mean, said the Bible commentary, volume seven, page eight, fifty-one, eight, fifty-two. So, Jim? Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching the hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power under the influence of the threefold union this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. From the Great Controversy, page 588. Okay, let's think about what's going on in our world right now. Is there any possibility that there's a confluence of evil powers on one part of the world trying to attack? And is it possible that we will, un before too long, get the idea that the only way to respond to that is a Christian force led by a Christian leader? <laughs> Where isn't there a force of evil going on in the world today? Yeah. Including well, I, in the Christian nations. God doesn't force anybody. Yeah, well, no. Uh, hand yourself no, but, over. But in the nations, in the nations. No. We're not talking about what God does, we're talking about what we're gonna see in the world. Oh, that's... Satan will force some issues out in the open, such as the death penalty for those who do not worship on Sunday. Right there it says, it's coming. But Satan also has other very subtle deceptions that we need to be prepared to resist. What are they? Immortality of the soul is one. Yeah. Babylon became a symbol of error, a center of apostasy, an arch enemy of the truth. Babylon conquered Jerusalem and finally destroyed it three times in the late 7th century BC. And was, what was its major theological error? It was substituting human demands and human authority for the truth of God as represented in the Bible. In order for God to win in the end, a huge transformation and change in our understanding needs to take place. Now we already said, what, what, what is it we have to understand very clearly? Remember? God's character, his government, and what he's asking of us. What, what? Obedience. Obedience, yeah. In order for God to win in the end, a huge transformation and change of understanding needs to take place. Revelation 14, 8, the second angel's message and 18, one to four, repeating that message, make it very clear that those who want to be faithful followers of God need to come out of Babylon. While God's faithful people are threatened with death and their right to buy and sell are taken away, those faithful people will be calling others around them to come out of Babylon. And what happens if we have a universal uh, digital currency? We'll quickly have nothing. Well, it means that people who have control of the of that digital currency system will be able to tell you whether or not you can buy and sell. And they will be able to tell you where and when you can buy and sell. Now, Babylon is the symbol of error and the symbol of all evil. Mm -hmm. And yet ancient Babylon, as we know, had Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, whatever the three were these, that were there influencing them. And there was the king, Nebuchadnezzar, who supposedly followed the god of Daniel for a time. After some pretty remarkable... Um, <laughs> After some persuasive, convincing... Arm, arm twisting. <laughs> that is being, being uh, insane for several years. Uh, look so why, you know, consider how 
much worse Babylon would have been without those influences. Yeah. Ezekiel 20, someone who lived in the days of Babylon. We have a passage here. Is that yours, Myra? Who's? Is that my turn? I think it's mine. It could uh, be my I think turn. It's then the Lord spoke to me, mortal man, he said, speak to these leaders and tell them that the so what the sovereign Lord is saying. You have come to ask my will, have you? As surely as I am the living God, I will not let you ask me anything. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. Doesn't God always answer our prayers? Well, read on, we'll get an idea why this says this. Oh. Are you ready to pass sentence on them, mortal man? Then do so. Remind them of the disgusting things their ancestors did. Tell them what I am saying. When I chose Israel, I made them a promise. I revealed myself to them in Egypt and told them, I am the Lord your God. It was then that I promised to take them out of Egypt and lead them to a land I had chosen for them, a rich and fertile land, the finest land of all. I told them to throw away the disgusting idols that they loved and not to make themselves unclean with the false gods of Egypt because I am the Lord their God. But they defied me and refused to listen. They did not throw away their disgusting idols or give up the Egyptian gods. I was ready to lead them. Let I was let, ready to let them feel the full force of my anger against uh, my anger there in Egypt. Okay, but now we know what that is. Yes. Giving them up. Giving them up. Okay, go ahead. But I did not, since so that would have brought dishonor to my name. Wait, wait, hold on, wait. What's he doing here? Preserving He's saying, I can't give up on my people because it would dishonor my name. Okay, read on. For in the presence of the people among whom they were living, I had announced to Israel that I was going to lead them out of Egypt. So is God saying, I had to do it because I said I would do it? But yep. didn't God know in advance that yes. what would happen? Yes. So why did he say... Well, read on. Let's see if we get some Keep more reading, ideas. reading, huh? Yeah. Teacher. And so I led them out of Egypt into the desert. I gave them my commands and taught them my laws, which bring life to anyone who obeys them. I made the keeping of the Sabbath a sign of the agreement between us to remind them that I, the Lord, make them holy. Would that be still a sign in our day? So there's another meaning for the Sabbath, not just a memorial of creation. Not just huh? a memorial of creation. But even in the desert they defied me. They broke my laws and rejected my commands, which bring life to anyone who obeys them. They completely profaned the Sabbath. I was ready to let them feel the force of my anger there in the desert and destroy them. Let them go. Let them reap the consequences of their own behavior, right? But, but I did not, since that would have brought dishonor to my name among the nations that had seen me lead each Israel out of Egypt. Their job was supposed to be to represent God correctly to the whole world. Okay? So I made a promise in the desert that I would not take them to the land I had given them, a rich and fertile land, the finest of, land of all. I made the promise because they had rejected my commands, broken my laws, and profaned the Sabbath. They preferred to worship their idols. Is that us too? Well, false concept of God. Yep. But then I took pity on them. I decided not to kill them there in the desert. Instead, I warned the young people among them, do not keep the laws your ancestors made. Do not follow their customs or defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Obey my laws and my commands. Make the Sabbath a holy day so that it will be a sign of the covenant we made and will re remind you that I am the Lord your God. All of that from Ezekiel 20, verses 2 through 20. It is extremely important to see why God did not reject them either. Quote, that would have, excuse me, that would have brought dishonor to my name among the nations. Ezekiel 20, 16 and elsewhere. I must remember, Moses played a vital role in this, mm -hmm. what we're discussing right now. Exactly. God is concerned about, I mean, John 17, 3. Yes. Salvation is to know God, to know Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
so forth. So it's extremely important to see why God did not reject them earlier. God is concerned about how every individual perceives him because, and there's our verse, and eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing and Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ whom you whom sent. Thou hast sent. To be permitted to have a view of God is the highest privilege accorded to men. This privilege should be prized above all earthly distinction or honor. If knowledge of God is a means to salvation, then what else is more important than that? Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and His attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshippers of Baal. Whoa! <laughs> Many even of those who claim to be Christians have allied themselves with the influences that are unalterably opposed to God and His truth. Thus, they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Okay, does that happen in our day? Mm. One final point that is important to remember, Satan is very adept at manipulating our emotions. Will we be able to resist those emotions? What role should emotion play in our religious experience? Satan <laughs> will work the miracles to deceive. He will set up his power as supreme. The church will appear as, it, as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners of Zion will be sifted out, the shaft will separated from the precious wheat. This is the terrible ordeal. But nonetheless, it must be. It must take place. None of those who have been overcome, been overcoming. None but those. But those who have been overcoming the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony will be found, with the loyal and the true. Okay. So this is Ellen White, having spent some time in Europe, writing a letter back to the leaders of the Adventist Church in North America. What is she trying to say? None Tough of those times are that uh, have worked the, to stay loyal mm -hmm. will be lost. Yeah, there, there, there's shaking times. This is not, this is not easy. It's going to be tough, folks. But we need to be prepared, and we know how to get prepared. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for these lessons which are spelling out these issues so clearly. We thank you for the guidance that's being given to us. May we take it to heart, to understand it, and apply it in our lives as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.